Hi guys, chapter 15 of Far North uh, here. Um, your question today, super easy. You're filling out one of those, um, those forms that says somebody wanted but so then, okay? We've talked about those in class before. You know exactly what to do with that. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Come to the uh, office hours uh, for help. Otherwise, uh, let's just hop right in. Uh, these chapters are kind of long, but they're good and they're filled with information and they keep, at least they keep me on the edge of my seat. So, uh, that being said, chapter 15. We stayed inside the cabin the next day. I was stoking the fire and Raymond was in a trance, holding Johnny's little hand drum and focusing on nothing at all. Outside, the wind down from the Arctic was blowing a gale as it almost always did in Dead Men Valley bending the tall spruces as if they were saplings. The gusts blasted down the frozen river, driving the stinging snow and compressing it into drifts. In the afternoon, Raymond took the letter out and read it over to himself, then folded it back up and stuck it in his pocket. The letter didn't seem to give him any peace. I took the file and sharpened the axe just to have something to do. Raymond never noticed me. Why do you guys think that is? Why is Raymond in his own world right now? So Johnny died, but why is Raymond just to himself? Think about it. I went down to the creek with the ax to break open a spot where we always collected our water. The entire area was covered with a slowly moving sheet of overflow water that had the consistency of oozing gelatin. The overflow was coming from just upstream, where a strong head of water was bubbling up through the ice like an artisan well. As Raymond had explained to me, when the creeks freeze deep, the water moving under the ice has to find somewhere to go. So it splits the ice at a weak point and forces its way to the surface, where it fans out in a slushy mass before freezing solid. Above the source of the overflow, I found a new collection spot and accidentally splashed water all over myself trying to chop the new hole. The water froze instantly to my, cl my clothes. I barely noticed. I was in a sort of trance myself. I hauled the water back to the cabin. I made what we were calling beaver stew with no other ingredients but shredded beaver meat and water. All the while, my mind was racing. I had only one thought, escape down the frozen Nahani while we still had food and strength. There had never been another airplane. We'd quietly given up on the signal fire at least 10 days ago. We had to do something. The two brothers this valley was named after, the prospectors back, back in 1908, didn't get out in time. I handed Raymond a plate of beaver stew. He looked at me as if he'd never been away, and he said, We have to get out of here. Amen to that, I agreed. And before it snows again, a lot of snow would make it a whole lot harder. Hike out down the river. Is that what you're thinking, too? With a nod, he said, There's no other way. We only have two bullets left. Uh, we don't have any reason to think the moose are still around, and even if they were, I can't hunt like Johnny. Let's go while, while we still have the beaver meat. If we come to open water, we'll just walk around it. How far is it down to Nahani Butte, do you think? Too far to carry the meat and everything on our backs. It could be a hundred miles, and who knows how long it would take us. We need to make a toboggan. Is it a canyon all the way? The last 40 miles or so is all different. It's called the Splits. That's where I got my moose. The river winds all over the place. It's got lots of islands, lots of different channels, all open country, real flat. We found two perfectly straight young birches in the ridge three or four hundred feet above the floor of the valley. We prepared the logs just as Johnny had, stripping long slats for the toboggan the same way he'd stripped the material for the snowshoe frames. Then we went to work with my pocket knife and Raymond's sheath knife, whittling our narrow boards down to roughly uniform thickness. 
Raymond slowly worked the bend into the slats at one end, shaping them over his knee. We lashed them together with the vici and tied the curved front end back to the toboggan to keep the proper bend in place while the wood was drying out. The toboggan took us three days to build. As we were finishing it, I scooped up the ha a handful of shavings and was about to toss them in the stove. Raymond said, maybe we shouldn't do that. Why not? The elders always take the scraps outside and spread them out in the woods. They say otherwise you won't find a good birch when you need one. I thought about it and said, there might be something to that. I guess it's showing respect for a tree. They always say even the trees have spirits. Sounds crazy, I guess. I said, if I had never been to the north, maybe it would sound crazy to me. But I'm getting the idea. It's like what Johnny said, make more beaver. When I said that, he added, They say that living things don't die right away when they're killed or cut down. The spirit can stay around for days or months or even longer. Same as our old friend, I pointed out. We used the bowline, bowline I salvaged from the raft as the pull rope for the toboggan. It was all we had left of the parachute cord. We attached it at both ends on the front. One of us would pull the toboggan by walking inside the rope. On the last day of the year, December 31st, we pre-cooked all the beaver meat for our hike out. It was Raymond's idea. The easy part was the quick freezing. Set your plates of stew outside the door, wait 10 minutes, then chuck the rations into the army box. The meat filled one box and half of a second one. Sometime during our last night in their cabin, a bird started croaking not very far away. Did you hear that? Raymond whispered. Is it a raven? Ravens aren't supposed to talk at night. That's not a good sign. In the morning twilight, we decided on what was absolutely essential. Everything else we'd leave behind. We'd take along Johnny's moccasins and his blanket. We'd leave most of the pots and pans, Raymond's gym shoes, the camp shovel, Johnny's parka, the beautiful beaver pelts he had tanned. Raymond looked a long time at Johnny's hand drum then said, I'll come back for this next summer. We lashed everything down on the toboggan, including all three pairs of snowshoes. We rigged the axe where we could get at it. Raymond shouldered the pack sack, latched the door, and picked up the rifle. I started out pulling the toboggan and had the day pack on my back. It was New Year's Day and 40 degrees below zero. That's 72 degrees below freezing, I thought. I took a glance back at the cabin and saw the blue smoke drifting out of the chimney and spreading out along the ground. I remembered the night Johnny had led us to this cabin under the northern lights, and I thought about all that had happened there. Raymond, I realized, was also looking back. The surface of the Nahani was mostly glare ice. The toboggan was sliding along behind me of its own accord. The walking was so easy we soon rounded an island, passed a second, and found ourselves about where our log raft had piled against the ice a month before. Not far ahead loomed the tall gate of the lower canyon. A short while later, we entered the gate and passed inside. A couple of miles and around a bend, we encountered an icy fog hugging the bottom of the canyon. It had to be coming from open water. Raymond and I looked at each other and said nothing. Forty below zero, yet open water, just as we feared. So because if there's open water, that means they can't go on, they can't be traveling on the river like what they're doing. So that means they're going to have to go back in to the forest where there's snow, which is something that makes traveling so much harder so they're like oh man this stinks so that's why they're like oh just as we feared when we got down to the riffles our fears eased it was only a narrow strip of running water with a cliff on the side but plenty of room to get around on the right on the right every mile or two we encountered another stretch of open water i couldn't understand it Right beside the exposed water, the ice would be full two feet thick. I don't get it, I said. Why isn't the ice two feet thick all across the river? What causes these open spots? It's 
January. Beats me, Raymond said. Maybe tricky currents can rile up the water and keep it from freezing. That might explain it. Maybe there's even hot springs right under the bed of the river. I know about some further down. I've been there, right where the canyon ends and the splits begins. So they were nervous because they saw this open water, but it ended up not being that big of a deal. If, if this is as wide as the river was, the open water was only about this big. So they are still able to get through on the ice on the other side. Uh, let's see. We pushed on between the blue gray walls of the canyon. The rim of the canyon, thousands of feet above, glowed pink, signaling day's end coming soon. And we thought better of continuing. On an island, we cut down a pair of dead spruces and tried to start a fire with the butane lighter, but it wouldn't function at these temperatures. We were out of kitchen matches, so it was going to be Raymond's fire starter from now on. It worked like a charm. By the light of the fire, we slashed dead limbs from live trees and dragged in driftwood until we knew we had enough to take us through the night. A quick supper, two plates apiece, then we got into our sleeping bags and began the torturous wait for those five hours of daylight to return. So, there's only five hours of daylight. Talk about, like, a short day. So, there's 24 hours in a day, right? So, if there's only five hours of daylight, that's only... Uh, 15 hours that's not only that's 15 hours of darkness that's a lot of darkness especially in the middle of nowhere and they can't move in the dark so they're forced to stay where they are for at least 15 hours crazy crazy I don't know if I could do it um, we sat up into the night stoking the fire trying to stay as warm as possible Raymond said I wish we could have been at Nahani Butte for Christmas. You wouldn't believe the food. Try me. Raymond's face glowed. After church, there's a great big potlatch. A feast. Everybody comes. It's in the community hall. So, a potlatch, okay, it's spelled P-O-T-L-A-T-C-H. It's what we would call a potluck, right? Uh, it's just the Canadian version of saying that. So, if we were gonna have a potluck for our, our class, I would bring stew, Miss Short could bring dessert, Mrs. Schluger would bring a salad, okay? Everyone brings a different dish, so that's what a potluck or a potlatch is. How many people is that? Oh, about 85, I guess. You're kidding. I was picturing it more like three or 400. He tossed a branch, a big branch, on the fire. That's the good thing about Nahani. Everybody knows you. Everybody looks out for everybody else. Tell me about the feast, I said. That's the part I want to know about. Well, there's everything you could think of. Modern food and traditional. People always save bear meat for potlatches. Black bear. With great big straps of fat. That is my favorite. Uh, when will the next potlatch come along? Oh, there'll be one for Johnny, a real big one. People will come from all over. They'll tell about the things he did in his life, and they'll feed his spirit by putting some food in the fire. I can picture you doing all that in person, I said. You'll be there. We're going to make it. I could tell about what he did in the very last part of his life. We slept as best as we could on the blue tarp spread over four inches of branches. Every few hours, we'd start shaking, and one of us would get up and heap another round of fuel on the glowing mass of coals. The next day, the wind quit, quit blowing down the canyon, the sky turned a dark gray, and the temperature rose to ten below. The walls of the canyon climbed sheer from the river in some places. In others, they rose from slopes of shattered rock. The walls were composed of horizontal bands of lime, limestone from river to sky, like the bluffs along the Guadalupe River back in the Texas Hill Country, but on a much grander scale, with the dwarf evergreens clinging to impossible locations and frozen waterfalls attached to sheer rock faces and glowing pale blue. Every time we encountered open water, we found a way around one side or the other. Our hopes were soaring. 
We'll be taking a bath in those hot springs soon, Raynan said. Instead of, instead of a sponge bath without a sponge. Late in the day, we passed an island with the typical massive drift pile on its upstream end. We talked about camping there, but islands and drift piles were plentiful, and an hour of twilight remained. We decided to press on. Raymond was pulling the toboggan, and I had the pack sack on my back. Just below the island, where the canyon narrowed, open water rushed out from under the ice and sped toward a cliff on the left side, leaving no ice to walk on over there. From the cliff, the strip of open water angled gradually back across the entire width of the river, passing briefly under a big ice bridge before slashing again against another sheer cliff a short distance down on the right side of the canyon. Bad luck, I said. Open water from cliff to cliff. We were stopped, unless we wanted to try crossing the ice bridge. I looked downriver. If we got past this place, it was good walking as far as I could see. We approached the ice bridge and took a closer look. It was about 50 feet across and about 10 to 20 feet wide, with ice shelves extending to the shores on either side. What do you think? I asked Raymond. It looks to me like it should hold us. Raymond kept studying the bridge. Should we build a raft and get across here? There's that drift pile we just passed. We don't have any parachute cord except for the pull rope on the toboggan, and that sure wouldn't do it. I don't know. Maybe we could tear some of our stuff into strips to tie the logs together? I don't know either, Raymond said slowly. The water is so fast. Even if we could patch together some kind of raft tomorrow, we'd have to launch it just past the ice bridge, and from there, it's such a short distance on the water. 50 meters, maybe? Then the raft would crash against the cliff at the bottom, and we'd be scrambling to get out on the ice. What if the ice down there wouldn't hold us? It'll all be happening real fast, I said. That's for sure. It's getting late, Raymond said, looking around. I think fooling with a raft would be riskier than the ice bridge. We sure could waste a lot of time and wreck our stuff trying it. Dropping the pack sack to the ground, I took off my parka and cap, my outer mitts, and then my gloves, and tucked them under the lashing on the toboggan. I started for the ice bridge. I'll test it first without all of this stuff. So, what they're doing. So basically, the water is rushing underneath the ice, but it's caused so much water, and like there's open water from side to side, they can't just walk. However, because of how thick the ice can be, there's a bridge. So if this is where the water is, the bridge is over top. So they're trying to get across this open water by walking on ice. So that's why they're so like kind of freaking out. They're like, okay, we gotta be careful. This is this is kind of dangerous, stuff like that. So I'll test it first without all this stuff on. Careful, Gabe. I took a few steps onto the ice bridge. So far, so good, I said. I think it's okay. Are you sure? I heard from behind me. Slow and easy, I said, taking a few more steps. I glanced back and saw Raymond there, watching intently. Halfway across, with no warning, the ice broke with a sudden crack. I spun around, trying to get back safely, but the big middle piece of the bridge under me slumped and broke free into the river. As I struggled for balance, the mass of ice started floating downriver with me on it. I looked over and saw Raymond on the shore with, and saw the shock on his face. Then I looked downstream and realized exactly what was going to happen. If I floated past that cliff on the right, Raymond couldn't possibly reach me. Just as I realized I was going to have to swim for it, the ice underneath me rolled and I was pitched into the water. Now you've done it, I thought. The shock of the cold water squeezed all the breath out of my lungs. I caught a glimpse of Raymond running along the bank. All encumbered by my heavy clothes and boots, I swam as best as I could for the shore. I had to get to the shore before the cliff, or I was dead. I concentrated on Raymond's face inside that circle of fur on his parka ruff. The wall was coming up fast. I swam with all the strength I had left, fighting the clothes and the boots. I thought I'd lost, but his arm reached out and yanked me out of the water and onto the ice. Get up, he was yelling. Get up? 
I couldn't breathe. He stood me up and my clothes stiffened just that fast. He hustled me along the shore, stopping only to pull on my parka mitts and, glo- and cap. We need fire, he shouted and started yanking the toboggan upriver. We've got to get back to that drift pile. I ran alongside thinking, now you've done it, now you've done it. I kept stumbling forward encased in my ice hardened clothes, losing the feeling in my arms and legs. I could see the drift pile now in the dimming twilight. All pumped up with adrenaline, I ran ahead of, of Raymond. When we got to the drift pile, I kept running back and forth, just trying to keep moving. I was aware of Raymond gathering kindling. I saw him take shredded birch bark out of his pocket. I saw the shower of sparks from his fire starter. I watched his kindling catch. I rushed, I rushed over, and he pushed me back. He was adding more sticks, babying his fire. I was standing there, frozen as a post, brain frozen, too. Raymond turned to the toboggan, freed the tarp, threw the spare clothes on it, including Johnny Raven's moccasins. The wind was fanning the fire into the heat of the drift pile. It was dry wood, and it went up fast. I stood close. Too close. Raymond yelled at me to get back, and he helped me strip off my wet clothes. The drift pile was, be- drift pile was becoming an inferno of heat. Within another five minutes, I was flash cooked. I changed into dry clothes, pulled on Johnny's moccasins. The flames soared 20, 30 feet high, pushing us further and further back, lighting up the canyon walls hundreds of feet above. The danger was over. No damage was done. Raymond nodded toward the bonfire. Not a hot spring, but same idea. Saved my life, I said. Raymond waved me off. Oh, I just didn't want to go back to Dead Men Valley myself. In the morning, we started back to the cabin. We were beaten, quiet as the canyon itself and filled with dread. It warmed up and began to snow about midday. By the next morning, three feet of snow had fallen. We took turns breaking trail and muscling the toboggan. My ribs started aching again. My mind drifted away from the effort and the tedium of lifting one snowshoe high and then the next while pulling the toboggan. I figured out that the brothers who ended up headless back in 1908 probably had tried to escape down the river just like we had, and they'd been, they'd been turned back to Dead Men Valley just like we had. The return trip took us four days, slogging through the deep snow. At last, the cabin came into sight, and we trudged the last hundred yards, completely spent. I took off the snowshoes, unlatched the cabin door, and was nearly inside when I detected a quick movement in the back of the cabin. I caught a glimpse of the wreckage and became aware of a strong, repulsive smell as my eyes found my danger. In the back corner, behind pe- uh, sections of, stoves, of stove pipe and the upended table, crouched a dark, heavily furred animal I'd never seen before in my life, about the size of a small bear. Its beady eyes were locked on mine, then it bar- barred its teeth. Suddenly, the cabin erupted with a f- vicious, snarling, utterly ferocious growl. Just then, Raymond grabbed my parka and yanked me back, yelling, Wolverine! Raymond pulled me back outside through the open door, shouting, He'll tear your face off! Barely behind us, the Wolverine shot out of the door. It ran halfway across the clearing, then stopped and looked back at us, still growling. I got a good look at that long, at the long front claws and powerful jaws. They're not that big, Raymond said, but even grizzlies leave them alone. In another moment, the nasty-tempered, low-slung little beast loped off into the field with a strange, bounding gait. How did he get in? I wondered aloud. We stepped back inside the cabin. The place smelled rank, worse than musky. My question was answered as I looked up to see a hole in the roof where the wolverine had torn out the roof jack and knocked the stovepipe apart. Just about everything we'd left behind was in tatters. Raymond reached for Johnny's drum, which had been slashed into shreds. And that's the end of chapter 15. So, what a wild ride. They wanted to go all the way down the river, but they ended up having to go back to the cabin. Well, once they got there, they saw that all of their stuff was just completely ruined. 
so we're about to see how they push on uh, with the rest of this book. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I hope you have a good day, week, month. Hopefully you're saying, seeing this within the same week that I'm posting it. <laughs> if not, I, I wanted to say I miss you guys and keep watching. Peace.